medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram H5N1 update. Today we're going to talk about wastewater data and a new study that was just published looking at the airborne nature of H5N1. Influenza in general is divided into types, and there is type A, type B, type C, and type D. This bird flu that we're talking about, which is an H5N1, is a subtype of type A, but so are a bunch of other influenza viruses, which we get exposed to all the time. So there are avian types, which are H5N1, H7N3, et cetera, et cetera. Then there's the H1N1 that we sometimes see during the flu season, as well as a bunch of others that we typically see. These are all type A. Something that we can do on wastewater is determine whether or not it is a type A influenza. And it's something that looks like this. Now, this is not wastewater, but in fact, it's influenza positive tests that are reported to the CDC by week. And you can see here that type A, which is in yellow, is the most common reported. Here we are in May, and the amount that's being reported is actually very low here in terms of clinical laboratories. So this is going to be individuals, human beings, who are infected with type A. And that's important to understand in terms of wastewater, which is not necessarily from human beings. Here is more data from human beings. This is emergency room visits. And you can see where we are right now is at a point where total influenza is actually going down. As we talked about here in this slide, influenza that is being reported in terms of both type A and type B, which is in green, are both on the downward trend. This is data that is coming from human beings and human beings specifically that are reporting to a clinical venue. Now that's completely different when we talk about wastewater. Wastewater could come from human beings or animals. You're not seeing particularly people who are presenting to a healthcare environment. These are just anything coming from anywhere and they may or may not have symptoms at all. So this is everything in the environment, not necessarily coming from animals or human beings or in a clinical setting. So just be aware of that when we talk about wastewater. One of the tests that's really easy to do on wastewater is determine whether something is of the influenza A subtype. Looking at 600 sites across the country in multiple states, and they're able to see, do we see an increase in type A influenza? That's actually a pretty smart way of doing it because if we're going to see an increase in bird flu, it's going to pop up as a type A because bird flu is type A. But realize, if we see an increase in type A, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is bird flu H5N1, right? It could be any type of influenza type A. And they say that very clearly here. It could come from a human, it could come from animals or even birds, animal products even like milk or even an infected cow could be popping up in wastewater. This does not mean necessarily if we see an increase in type A in wastewater that there has been some sort of a jump into human beings. What have they been reporting? They say here for the week ending May 4th, 189 wastewater sampling sites reported data meeting criteria for analysis for influenza A viruses. And one site in one state was high influenza A virus level. For the week ending before that, April 27, 229 wastewater sampling sites reported data meeting criteria for analysis for influenza A. And three of them, which is about 1%, in three states were at a high influenza virus level. Across these two most recent weeks, a total of 230 sites from 34 states reported data meeting criteria for analysis for influenza viruses in both weeks or in either week. Three sites, or 1%, in three states were at high influenza A virus levels. Here we can see a map that looks at this current situation. Where we have above average to high, we're seeing purple or dark purple. And we're seeing that here in Alaska. We're seeing that in Texas and Oklahoma and over here in Michigan. And what does this mean? Just about anything. It could mean that H5N1 is going up in animals and we're seeing a wastewater because of that. Or it could be flipping over. So how would we know if this surge in wastewater in these particular areas are leading to a situation where H5N1 has become airborne and is going into human beings and is now being transmitted between those? 
Well, we would start to know that if we started to see an increase in hospitalizations of type A. And then, of course, if those hospitalizations ended up in being subtyped out as H5N1. That's exactly what's being looked at right now in terms of the CDC monitoring what it is that's going on. So wastewater is very sensitive, but it is not very specific. I wanted also to talk about this paper that was published in Nature. It's actually published the day that this video is being recorded on May 15th. And it's talking about the risk assessment of highly pathogenic H5N1 influenza virus from minks. So minks are interesting creatures because they have airways that are very similar to human beings. And that's why they are looked at very carefully. What they're looking at here is how likely is it and how pathogenic could it be if H5N1 jumped into human beings by being airborne. This particular virus is not, I repeat, it is not the virus that we are seeing currently circulating in cattle, cattle farms and milk farms and things of that nature. This is actually from 2022, where there was an outbreak in mink. So we're looking at that particular strain of H5N1. In the abstract, they say outbreaks of highly pathogenic H5N1 clade 2.3.4.4b, which is the same clade, by the way, that is circulating currently, but it's not exactly the same virus. In farmed mink and seals, combined with isolated human infections, suggests that these viruses pose a pandemic threat. To assess this threat, using a ferret model, and again, that's used because very similar airways, we show an H5N1 isolate derived from mink transmits by direct contact to 75 of exposed ferrets. That's not news. We know that influenza does spread through droplets, and that's direct exposure. The question, though, is whether or not there is airborne transmission that can be aerosolized. And they say here that it actually can in 37.5% of contacts. And they'll show you that here in the study. We're going to look at this. They further go on to say that sequential analysis of the genetic material show no mutations were associated with transmission. However, the H5N1 virus also has a low infectious dose and remains virulent at low doses. This isolate carries an adaptive mutation, and here's that mutation. It's the PB2T271A. Now that A there at the end is important because if we were to transition that mutation back to the wild type to a T, then we don't see this type of virulence that we would normally see. So they say here that this mutation that they're seeing here in this type of virus, which they actually call the wild type in this particular virus, causes increased virulence. And if you get rid of this mutation, it actually reverses the mortality and airborne transmission. In other words, the concerning thing is just one specific mutation in this H5N1 isolate from two years ago caused it to become more virulent, causing more damage, more death in these minks, and it caused it to be airborne. This is the first report of an H5N1 clade 2.3.4.4b virus exhibiting direct contact and airborne transmissibility in ferrets. These data indicate heightened pandemic potential of the panzoonic H5N1 viruses and emphasize the need for continued efforts to control outbreaks and monitor viral evolution. Let's take a look at some of the data here. This graph, we're looking at ferrets that were already infected. These are called donors, DR1, 2, 3, and 4. And these are actual ferrets or minks, if you will, that have been infected. And we're looking at the antibody titers. They're all very high, all very infective. And as you can see here over time, the antibody titers get lower and lower as they go through this infection. When they're put into the same area as other minks or ferrets that have not been infected, you can see here that, for instance, DC2, the ones that actually pick up the virus, like for instance, this one right here, looks like they have antibody positive. That's one that got it. And then you can see this light green picks it up and this other blue picks it up. The green one picked it up and then this dark blue picked it up. So we see here that three out of four or 75% of the ferrets picked it up. If you look at clinical signs like percent body weight reduction, all of these guys that had the disease that we knew got worse. And you can see that they're clinically getting worse and worse and worse. Whereas here, only one, two, and three, three out of four or 75%, were able to get transmission. And this was through direct contact, basically droplet. 
Now, this is not news. We knew this. We knew that this is how influenza spreads. What we don't know is what about transmission through airborne. Now let's do the same thing, but we're looking at airborne transmission. Again, we've got our ferrets here that are infected. As you can see, the antibodies getting less and less over time. We put them together and we notice here how many get infected. Well, we see one get infected, that dark blue, and we see this light purple one get infected here. So here we see two out of four get infected. And again, we can see here that all of these ferrets that were initially infected, they're all getting worse when they're put together with this group of four. Here we see one and two out of four losing weight. So not only do we see animals body evidence of infection, but we see clinical evidence of infection. In this group, group one, we see that airborne transmission can occur in 50% on this one. If we go to this one here, again, we have our donors here that are going to donate the infection. They all show clinical signs. Notice here that only one out of these four get infected and only one of them here. So over here, one out of four or 25% get infected. If we take the average going back of two out of four and we add the one out of four, we get three out of eight. And that's where we get the 37.5 transmissibility by airborne. What's interesting about this is this. This particular virus, called the A-slash-Mink H5N1 virus, possesses an alanine at position 271 of the PB2 gene, which differs from the avian consensus sequence, PB2-271T. So in other words, that T becomes an A in this wild-type H5N1 virus in 2022 that infected these ferrets. And they believe that this is the reason why it was so deadly and why airborne transmissibility was seen at least for 37.5%. Prior studies have shown that this mutation contributes to mammalian adaptation of avian viruses. So what they did was they tried to do exactly the same experiment, except they switched this A back to the T. So they got rid of the mutation to see what would happen. They said, using site-directed mutagenesis, we reversed the PB2A back to T. To verify that this change altered polymerase function, we performed mini-genome assays. Introduction of the T, that means going back to the way it was, significantly reduced polymerase activity relative to the wild-type polymerase at both 33 and 37 degrees Celsius. When polymerase activity was expressed relative to wild type, the reversion back to the T reduced activity by 75% at 33 degrees Celsius and 50% at 37 degrees Celsius. So let's look at that data. We're going to do exactly the same airborne transmission data that we showed you before, except we're getting rid of that mutation that seems to have made it adapted well to not only infect ferrets, but also kill them off. And notice, what do you see here? There's absolutely no airborne transmission when you go back to the original genome. There was weight loss in all of these, so they had to show clinical signs. Notice, none of these ferrets got sick when they had the virus that changed back to the original before the mutation. Again, here we have the wild type, the blue, which has the mutation. And here in green, we go back to before it had the mutation. So what happens here? Notice with blue, there is more polymerase activity of the virus. Notice in blue that they have worse weight loss. Notice in blue, survival drops down to 0% very quickly, whereas in the reversion back before the mutation, we still have fairly good survival. So before anyone gets too concerned about this, there is some things that you should know. These were ferrets that were done in this experiment that had never been exposed to influenza. And they actually make a note of that here in the paper. They say, an important consideration interpreting our results with respect to the risk posed to humans is that the ferrets used in the studies had no pre-existing immunity to influenza, whereas the majority of humans have been exposed to H1N1 and H3N2 seasonal influenza viruses. While different influenza A virus subtypes are antigenetically distinct, some degrees of cross-protection against H5N1 may be conferred by prior exposure to these seasonal strains. If anything, this study makes me think about the real potential of getting a mutation that can change the virus and make it more infective. So it's something definitely that we need to watch for. The good news is, however, that currently, at least for now, hospitalizations and emergency room departments for all influenza A is going down, but it's something that we should definitely keep an eye on. 
Something else that you should keep an eye on is medcram.com for more continuing medical education for nurses, PAs, nurse practitioners, physicians. If you like this, subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment, and join us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.